Okay, so welcome everybody. Here we are for the Enable Systems Change in Organization. Uh, John is going to guide us today through a very practical example of how an organization actually redesigns a service. So that's hopefully useful for some of you here today. So the goal is really just to showcase that systems change in practice. Um, and the agenda is very simple. We're just going to do like a little icebreaker to know who is in the room, and then we'll just go straight forward to the case study for, uh, with John. Then we'll have a brief Q and A session, um, and I'm actually going to ask you to be putting your questions on the case study here. That's where you have this. I will share the mirror bar again right now, uh, but here it is. So here you can drop questions, and then we will go back to those after John's intervention. So um, yeah, this is uh, us who are facilitating. So John is part of the SI core team in the organizations hub, and I am a community developer at SI. Um, let's go on. So this event is hosted by the SI organizations hub. In case you don't know a lot or you haven't been to previous events of the organizations hub, you can find some of the things they've been working on for the last uh, well months. Uh, you have a few papers actually, and there's also some events you can find in, in the YouTube channel, like the recordings. And this is the amazing team behind it. We have only John here today, I think, but uh, there's also Sanjana, Andrea, Bern, and Tribura. So this is the team. I'm like meeting people all the time, sorry. Okay, and um, yeah, so for just to see who is here, uh, we will ask you to just uh, fill in this post -it that you have and just tell us your name, what is it that you do, maybe the organization you work in or your interests, whatever you want to tell us really and where you're based right now. So that would be great in, if you can do that. I'm actually going to do that myself. I am here in the south, well, not southeast coast of Spain. It's a network. Yeah. So let's see where everybody is. John is over there. Okay. Okay. Oh, my robot through. I've sent, I've just put it up. Yeah, I'll put it there again. Okay, so we have Sarita, okay, in London. Fernando from Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Nina from London. Roger. Oh, are you based in Barcelona? That's great. <laughs> someone from Spain here. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Lots of people in the UK, I can see. Um, we have someone else from Argentina. That's Giselle. Okay. Oh, Sao Paulo. Okay, Brazil. It's great. It's so nice. Wow. So a, a little bit of everywhere. We can see that you zoom out of the map. Great. So hopefully we get to know you a bit better by just having your names there and knowing you know where you're joining us from and maybe where your profession is uh so i'm just going to pass it on to john so that we get started with the case study i know that some people have to leave so hopefully they will get to listen a bit um yeah john you might want to just share screen so i will stop here just a reminder to everybody please that we are collecting your questions here so just grab a sticky and put any question that you have on the case study there and I will go over those after John's um, case study. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I will share my screen in a moment. So I'm going to show you a complex uh, example 
with quite a lot involved in there. It happens to be from the public sector, but it's just as relevant for the private sector as well. And uh, what I'm going to do is go through exactly what we did in the team. So this is this is one approach, and it's by far not the only possible approach. It's just the approach that I use. And if I asked you, how would you, how would we um, describe to someone who doesn't know how an organization works? How would we do that? This is a, this has been a puzzle uh, that I've been asking people. And the, uh, the kind of thing that I've got in my head is like a sausage machine where you have things coming in, you have something happening in the organization and you have outputs. But typically when you ask people, this is what they come up with. They come up with a hierarchy diagram. And what, what I'm going to do is describe what a, a service looks like from a, a systemic perspective. So if there are any problems with what I'm doing and you can't see or hear me or something's not quite right, just give me a shout, please, because uh, I can't see that. So I'm going to go straight in and find and t let you know how it started. So the, the leadership came, uh, asked me to... Uh, come in and help them and they said we don't want to do any big change but we've got some problems uh, and we're going to be testing you so we've never worked with you before John so uh, and I had no I very little idea as to what this service was about and what happened is that we I created a team so I said okay give me a, a team of people and they're going to be made up of someone in the leadership um, and the whole purpose of this team is we're just going to spend uh, three or four weeks learning about how what the problems are, what the current system looks like, what the issues are. And we're going to, what's going to happen is that after that, we will decide what to do next. So it was an emergent design and it was about engagement, engagement with the customer, who in this case would be the citizens in, in, in the area. And there'd be no, I'm not going to send you a report. I'm going to show you what the outcomes are uh, uh, in, with, together with the team. So the approach that I take is this one. The first stage is we understand. The second stage is that we sit with a team and do an, exp an experiment with different ways of working. And the third stage is to create a prototype of the new way of working. Uh, and this comes from someone called John Seddon. Some of you may be familiar with that. So let's have a look at what happened. Uh, the first thing I do is I start with a team and they don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, so we had a team of, I think, four people from this service. And this service is what is in England, in English is called housing allocations which is if you have a problem with housing, if you can't afford housing, that local government will supply you with a property to live. So I asked the team, what's the purpose of your service? And they said, easy is to give people a house. Okay, great. Uh, so what, what did we do next? The first thing that we did is we start from the very front. What's the very front? It's where the demand comes in it's 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 what drives the service so we started with listening to what the demands are that come in in the phone calls and when people come in and we physically sit and listen to the phone calls with a headset um, and we listen to the response that the organization has and also we start to look at what that flow starts to look like after that call. So starting to learn about the current system. And they used a 14 page form, online form and paper form to get the demand coming in, 14 pages. Um, that was really quite interesting. and. The, the model that I have in my head, I'm, and I'm not going to go through this in detail right now, and the reason is we don't really have enough time. This is called the model for check, and it comes from John Seddon, if you want to reference that later and have, have a look. This is based on systems thinking principles, 
and it's quite interesting but I'm going to take you through that model and the, the first part of that model is the demand that comes into the organization number one is what is the demand what type of demand is it what matters to people and then we're going to go into look at purpose so this is a summary of the demand so this took about a week to develop with a team because we had to listen to many calls and they're split up into value and failure demands now what does that mean the value demands if you can see them they are the ones that we're here for uh, I need I'm in need of housing can you help me solve my housing problem I want to move uh, and on the right hand side are the failure demands or what what is sometimes called preventable uh, I am chasing so I've I've you sent me a letter you said that you're going to do something but I haven't heard anything um, I refuse the property um, what's uh, I have to update details on my application I have a query I have a question um, you've asked me for information so there's a separation between the two types and, and what I do is I work with the managers especially the senior managers and we focus on one particular thing the amount of failure demand is 37 percent so what does that mean what that means is that there is a sorry the failure demand is 60 62.7 percent I'm reading the wrong figure 62.7 that means there is a possibility if we redesign this that we can cut out a lot of that we can design it out so that was that was a huge learning thing already and then what we did is the next stage is look at the measures so they had lots of measures but what about the measures from the customer's perspective so in systems thinking an important element is from different perspectives so let's have a look at it from the customer's perspective what would be the measure that we would have so I, I want to try something um, I haven't done this before and if you think it doesn't work I want you to tell me you might see my head appear in the in the bottom left hand corner uh, <laughs> okay so um, what's the customer measure if you ask the customer or a member of the public what would be the measure of success it would be perhaps from when I say I've got a problem to when you help me to resolve that when you give me a, when you give me a property now the organization didn't actually measure that but that's what we measured so we had to go into the data and we had to find out what that looked like and we started to put it onto a chart and we did it individual so what you can see here are two lines the first line is the average or the mean and the second line is what is called an upper control limit which is a, a bit of a technical description so we're going to focus on the on the average at the moment and you can see that it's all over the place and on the left it's number of days okay so this organization had three categories of people the first one is bronze second one is silver and the third one is gold gold are people in high need silver are people in medium need and bronze are people in not so not so much need and what we found is this bronze band the average was 655 silver it was 750 and in gold it was 675 now that's a long time and th that's just for people that are housed what about the people that aren't housed so at this point the director got a real shock he had no idea that it was bad like this um, so what's the next thing we did the next thing we did is we looked at the flow the flow all the way through the organization of what happens when someone when someone records uh, says hello I want to I, I want to to move and what happens all the way through to the very end um, and there were 87 steps. Mm. 
87. Now, what was interesting is that, again, that they'd never done this before. They'd never actually put all this together. They had a, they had a process chart somewhere written down that no one ever reads. But this was the real process. This wasn't the, this wasn't the documented process chart. This was the real one. And then, I, then what we did is I asked the team, how, how many of the 87 are value steps? What are value steps? Value steps are those act activities that directly contribute to the customer's need. And so they looked on there and we found that there were seven. So out of 87 steps, seven steps were value steps. And that was a huge shock to everybody because like they thought they were doing great things. Only seven of those activities contribute to the customer. And we also, uh, apart from listening to calls and talking to people, we actually at random took 16 people uh, off, off the database and we actually looked at what they were doing and how many times they bid and what kind of what kind of issues they were ha having, what was their need, their real need. So we went into some detail and we found out that over half of them were not in housing need, yet they were on our system. Uh, and during that, during those, that, those 16, we'd offered three people the uh, houses and three of them rejected those houses. So we think, what is going on here? So we were digging into the system and trying to understand. And there was one person in the team who was a bit confused as to what we were doing. So the team are made up of people from the service. Okay. They are frontline people. They're not change people. They're not systems thinking people. They're just people that do the, the work within the service. They're the ones that take the forms. They do the computer stuff. And there was one person there who wasn't very happy with what, what they were doing. So, I, John, I don't think I should be in the team. I'm, I, I don't know what you're doing. So I said, okay, take a typical example. Just take one example of someone that goes on the list and find out what happens. And then they mapped it out from the customer's experience, from their perspective. And at the end of doing that, she turned around and said, now I know what you're doing. Because on this, this person... It took them 13 months to get onto the system. 13 months from when they first submitted the application form. Wow. I mean, that's just, that's just, that's terrible. Okay. So I, I, was, I was exploring different ways of getting people to see a different perspective to what they were used to. So this is this is some of the things they told me about their work. We we only use application forms. We're not allowed to talk to people. Actually, we don't want to talk to people because they argue and they lie. We we don't like that. They sometimes they, they can be quite violent. So when I if you want me to talk to people, John, you're gonna have to I want to do it behind glass. And basically their job was all about the IT their job was managing IT it wasn't about the people and they the supervisor said John if if what you can do to help me is we have 6,000 people 6,000 people on the waiting list this was a town it wasn't a city what you need to do to help me is give me 6,000 houses so that was the challenge and what they did basically is they just followed a process they followed a standard process. So what we did is we, after, uh, after three weeks, we had mapped the process. So I asked them, can you take that whole process down into one sheet of paper? And that's what they did. So should we have a look at what they found? And they looked at data covering a month. So application comes in. It comes in through the post or online, and we have to index it. We have to, we have to match that with the, their records that they might already have. We have to check that everything is correct. 
and we have to put them on a gold, silver or bronze band. If they have a medical problem, they will have submitted a medical form as well, and we need to have that checked. And if they don't agree with the banding that we've given them, they can appeal, they can complain, and it's a terrible thing when they have to appeal, because we have to go through a terrible process that everybody hates um, to, to, to check whether it was the right banding. Um, and then maybe we change their band if their medical uh, medical form is tells us that they need to. Then we have to update their records. So they, they go on the waiting list and we have to update their records when things change. And there's always things that we have to pass back to them because of errors. They've filled in something incorrectly. They've missed something out. Anyway, once they've done all that, they wait for the advertisement to come out on, online or, or in the newspaper every two weeks. The, ad, the advertisement comes out, they have a look at the advertisements and they go, oh, that I like that property, I'm going to bid for it. So they bid for it and someone in the office after two weeks they have to take everybody that's bid and they have to check that their details are correct and they have to choose the person who is who is going to get the, get the house. So it might be 25 people have bid. They have to find the one person that they're going to give this to. And they offer that property. And they get the house. Easy, huh? So that was the process. So we looked at one month of data. 285 people submitted demand in one month. 75% of the information that came in was wrong, had to be sent back, 75%. 95% of those were medical forms. And it took six months for us to check the medical forms. 27 people in one month appealed. They disagreed with their banding. And that took seven months to deal with. And there were 6,000 people on the waiting list. 105 people uh, looked at the advertisement and d uh, decided that they would, uh, they would bid. Um, and from the people that bid, 35 in one month, 2,600 people bid and 35 people refused the property that they were offered. 87 people were housed. They didn't know any of this information. This was information that I helped them to pull out because they were just focusing on their activity. They weren't focusing on the whole, the whole thing. Okay, so... Um, after all of this, after a few weeks, I asked them, so now what do you think your purpose is? And they basically said, uh, we process application forms. That's what we do. We don't actually do anything else. We, that's, that's all we do. And it was a very negative, negative view of their work. They were very unhappy. The senior manager was unhappy. They were unhappy. They felt like just being part of a machine um, and it was hopeless they didn't really have any hope that, that we would get 6,000 houses and actually their job was to make it difficult for people to get houses because we have too many people wanting houses so we have to make it difficult for them right in terms of the process we've now finished the understand phase and so we went to the experiment and the experiment is you you get the team put them in a room and you can allow them to do things that before they couldn't do so they're given permission to not follow the rules not follow the 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 the, the um 
the the way that they have worked before they can decide to change it and so what happened is that they then focused on remember that they focused on the value work so i asked them just focus on doing the value work so it meant that they had to talk to people which they'd never done before um they weren't they they asked i asked them not to use the computer system and so what we started to do we started to take real demands and they started to record those demands that they took on the wall on paper and here's an example <clears throat> and you can see here they were recording different things and they were <clears throat> they were deciding what they would record so it was up to them what they did so we i think this was the second one the second demand we took it was from a lady who was already on the on the waiting list but she submitted a medical form she lives in a bungalow which is a, a house with no stairs uh, and a garden and she wants to move she submitted the form a year ago and she has problems walking and um, we, we phoned her up and the team didn't know what to say so they had to practice you know what, what do I say what do I ask and after a few hours of talking and I think we phoned up three times we said hang on a minute your what you say to us is you have a problem what's why do you want to move because it was very difficult to understand and she said well I don't really want to move but I have a problem with my garden I'm too old now I've got a medical problem I can't fix my garden and, and I can't afford to have a gardener so we realized it wasn't the problem with the house it was a problem with the garden so I'd asked the team they still have to solve this <laughs> So they spent a couple of hours trying to figure out how to solve it. And they went on the internet and they found a charity who does older people's gardens free of charge. We put them in, we put them in touch with her and we never heard from her again. Now that was a shock to the team because why was it a shock? Because they thought that, their purpose was to give people a house and not only that if they if they'd done this in in the in the old system they would have put her on the waiting list and they said she's got no hope of getting a property no hope of getting a house but we'll put her on the list anyway crazy i mean it was just it was just nuts so uh what happened then was that the demand that was coming in, the team realized it wasn't what they thought. So they found that 56% were actually not in housing need. They needed things like the garden. They, they, uh, they'd run out of money so they couldn't afford it or all sorts of reasons. 37% um, were in some need. So we realized that actually a lot of people on the waiting list were actually not in the right place we in the experiment we took 35 people and we dealt with them and we we dealt with every single person successfully 35 how many people did we need to house so this was the, the question so we had this long list how many people did we need to house three all the rest we did other things with them that wasn't giving them a new house or a you know a house that was new to them and this was a huge shock to the team so they learned that they had to do other things they had to help them in different ways and this picture in particular i really like because what they were doing before is that they were in that room pretending everything was logical and transactional and easy the reality is I helped them to open that door and discover what the reality was really about. So it was like the oh shit moment. So this is a good example of reframing, a, a systems thinking concept called reframing, where you help them to see things from a different perspective. And we focused by doing that, or to do that, we had to focus on what's the real purpose here. So 
the purpose moved shifted from giving people a house to oops sorry to helping me solve my housing problem and this was the for the director especially this was this was totally different to what he was expecting it was a real shock to everybody because now suddenly the team were meant to do very different things to what they were doing before so now we moved into the prototype remember this so how did the team redesign this uh, and if we had time we would uh, ask people here what you would do but um, so what actually happened is this we listen to the customer so they have to come in no no forms no digital forms no paper forms they have to come in and talk to us so we listen to them we ask them why they're here what do they need we write the details down on a sheet of paper we assess together with them we assess their level of need while they're sitting with us not six or seven months later and we identify options together with them that we think might be possible and we discuss that so, so we might say hey what about this and they go oh no that wouldn't work because I remember one person he was getting elderly he needed to be close to the hospital because he had to go to the hospital frequently he just wanted to move nearer the hospital and we ended up either housing them or helping them look for housing themselves that was it that was the new flow so we went from three computer systems forms writing letters and sending emails and the web to to uh, advertise houses we went from all of that to a sheet of paper <laughs> and here's an example of the sheet of paper where on the left you see the questions uh, and on the right you see what was written down that's all we needed to do that's that's it that's all we needed to do so we found this by in the experiment that's what the experiment was about we tried all different things and that's all we needed and then it was printed on the back as well in case we needed more questions to discuss the options and all that kind of thing and we created a new waiting list and the new waiting list was a whiteboard we hardly had anybody on the new waiting list so can you see that these are very visual things you know we started with a with a piece of paper we put it on the whiteboard now there are very very good reasons why we didn't do it digitally very good systems thinking reasons for doing that which we, we'll talk about uh, hopefully in at the end if I remember and what do we do with those forms so this 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 uh, place they were very proud of the fact they never throw anything away so they used to they used to keep all their documents for 10 years and then they used to put them in the basement they said John what do we do with all these documents now oh, okay well let's experiment with that let's see let's see what how off how much we need them so what they did is they experimented by putting them in a box when they didn't need them so this is version one when they when they finished with them we put them in and then they would write down when they needed to go back and use them and they realized that after six months they never need to go back again so they decided that after six months they throw away the forms and then they advanced to a more advanced version which was version two which is every person in the team had their own shelf and little pile where they could put their own so it was a bit more organized um, and that was it that was that was their prototype working so remember remember that picture of how they worked now they work together with the customer um, and it was a totally different way of working everything else was kind of taken out and the person who said I have to sit behind glass she was one of the people that 
totally love talking to people and, and, and sorting out the problems. So now it was about engaging with people. It was about listening to people. It was about managing cases and managing situations, helping people. We try our best. It's a good place to work. And we don't have an IT system yet, but we will in the future. So these are all the things that they told me at the end uh, of what it was like to do this. So uh, I'll be finishing now. What's, what were the results? Well, in the old system, there were 6,293 6, waiting list. After two years, they reduced the waiting list down to about 300. 309. There was, remember, 62.7 failure demand. That went down to 3%. Remember the 27 appeals a month, which they hated doing? In one year, they had one appeal. There was a lot of aggression and frustration, and that changed to staff becoming very motivated. And there was an unknown cost to the system, and now to the, to the wider public service system. Now we, they develop links to other parts of the public sector, and they had 22 people working there initially, now they only needed 15. That's it. That's the case study. So I use that method, that methodology for any public or private sector organization. I use the same thing. I do demand analysis. I use three stages. I help people to reframe the problem, etc. all of that. So it's the same, same approach. Okay, uh, you're going to have to help me with uh, if you have any further questions or or anything that you want me that you want me to talk about. Yeah, are there any questions here on the? Well, I don't see any on the chat, and I don't see any on the Miro either. I don't know if anybody has any question that you can just speak up, like open your micro and that's it, or you can just leave them on the chat. I'm dropping the my report again, just in case. Or if you just, yeah, sit them in the chat, or if you just want to unmute yourself, because we've got, a rel you know, 16, group of 16. Let's see how that goes. Who wants to go first? If there are any questions. Just how long did it take, uh, John? Sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Maybe I missed that detail when you were talking. No, I didn't really. I didn't really go through that. Um, the understand phase normally takes about four weeks. Sometimes I can can do it within two weeks. If it's a more simple transactional service, it can take two weeks. Yeah. Um, depends on how deep I want to go, but in this case, it took four weeks. The experiment phase, I I, I kind of started them off and I I left them to it only popping back every now and again. Uh, that lasted a few weeks because they had 35 to go through. And yep. some of that was quite difficult. And then the prototype was relatively straightforward. So uh, again, they did that on their own. I really wasn't there for most of the time. So we're talking about the experiment and the prototype each taking several weeks. Yep. So in length of time, it was quite long. Thank but, you, Paul. Yeah, but I think you're sort of listening to how you were describing how you solve the problem. The, the duration is partly determined by the key thing was the engagement with the people who are actually doing the process. So you've yes. just been sat there looking at a computer system like you could have, you know, you could yeah. be a lot shorter. But it was quite obvious as you were going through it that the real thing was about changing people's um, perception of what the um, situation was, which if we're truthful, if we're looking at systemic thinking, it probably is the major challenge always rather than sometimes. That's always a challenge, Paul, and, and thank you for highlighting that. That was the main reason. That's the whole point of doing this. And what's actually happening is that the, the focus for me is on changing thinking. Um, it's switching from a reductionist approach to a systems thinking approach. 
I don't tell them that all the time. And I do a lot of work with the, with the senior managers because they have to go through this as well. So they're directly connected to the team. Um, they come, I, the senior sponsor comes in at least once a week, uh, engages with the team. And that's one of the reasons why there's these physical things on the walls is that sometimes someone will drop in and we, we want to just, the team just want to show them what we've been doing. And you have much greater ownership when you have those things on the wall. Um, so it's the frontline people who have never done this before that I get to do it. So that takes time. So I hope that answers some of the questions. And also there's a question there from John Evans. Uh, did this approach sp spread organically? So what, we f what they found is that this worked very well and they wanted to spread it out. But also they realized that this service wasn't just in isolation now, it was connected to other ones. So in total, we did four, four pieces of work in four different services. And each time I was training up their own internal people and they then carried on doing that without me. Um, how was the acceptance from teams of this low tech proposal at the time when all people asking for a solution, a solution like automation, IT to reduce people, etc. cetera. Um, I didn't get that and I don't get that because those people, when I, when I have the team in the bubble, no one is allowed to interfere with them. And there's a lot of people outside the bubble going, oh, this isn't gonna work, they're not using digital IT. I don't really know because what happens is that the outcome proves itself. And what normally happens, if this is stage one, stage two is let's pull in the IT. So it took a couple of years because this was actually a very involved uh, change. They did pull in IT and they did digitalize it, but they kept the essential elements that were, that were there. So for instance, people still had to come in and talk to them. That never changed. So it's kind of like a slow progression rather than a quick rush to fix things using digital. The sponsor, so Fernando, the sponsor was, uh, it's always a very senior person in the organization. So it was a director who had responsibility for this service and all the other services. And the chief executive was also uh, part of this and they got very interested in what was going on. Uh, who were, how did I deal with people that were resistant? Well, when you're in the team, you're not really resistant because they're the ones doing the work. The people outside of the bubble, um, okay, so their colleagues in, in the department that were there who weren't part of this, when we got to the prototype stage, what the team did is slowly start pulling people in, their colleagues in from the old way of working, one by one. So the new team would grow and the old team out there would slowly get smaller and smaller. And as they pulled them in, they would sit with them and they would show them the new way of working. There were actually people who did not like this way of working because they came in, they preferred the IT approach and all that kind of thing. Uh, there were a couple of people who didn't like this. They didn't like to talk to people, etc. So those, those, they had to be kind of, they either chose to stay there or move to a different service. But yeah, and also I had someone from the IT change area uh, as part of the team so that they, they wouldn't like start telling us that we're doing the wrong thing. They, they also were connected to this and started to realize the benefit of doing this. Okay, uh, it seems a big thing for managers to allow the experiment stage. Yes, it is a big thing. And the only way that they allow that is to make sure that there are people like me in there and the managers themselves are allowed to come in and just make sure, give them the parameters of what they're allowed, you know, uh, make sure they're not breaking the law, making, make sure we're not doing the wrong thing. And that's very strong within the team. And at the end of the experiment, don't forget, we could just say, okay, the experiment is finished now. We can go back to doing in, to doing what we were doing. So 
it's no risk or very low risk to do the experiment. The prototype stage is different, but the experiment is just learning. It's trying out new ideas. The power dynamics, so thank you for that, Kisa. The power dynamics change significantly. So instead of us telling people what we're going to give them, we have that discussion with them. And the power is actually more to do with the people that need help. They'll say, no, no, that, that's not going to help me. Okay, well, let's talk about different other things. So a big switch in, in power and um, very, very different way of working. They don't all come out like this, okay? So some... <laughs> This was just an extreme version. In, in a lot of cases, you, they, they still do similar things to, like if I do this in the bank or an insurance company, um, that fundamental change isn't quite so big. So this is a, a very complex service. And um, although the method I use is the same, the, the changes are not quite the same, but it still shifts. All of those things I've mentioned still shift. Okay, any more questions, uh, Paloma? Can you help me to identify any ones that I haven't seen? Yeah, not on the Miro. I think it's, I think that's it. There's no any more questions. Okay, yeah, great. We covered all of this, so yeah. Okay, so just a couple of things about what's behind the method that I use in the model. Um, I use the iceberg diagram. So what I do is I help people go be beyond, below the surface of what they see. Um, and I and I do work obviously with the team, but also with the senior managers to go and asking them the questions. So, why is that happening? Why did why do we have forty five steps and only uh, was it I can't remember how many forty seven steps and only seven of them are value? Why did you design it like that? So well, these are all questions to they feel uncomfortable with these questions but they're also very important ones that they need to ask themselves and by doing that you just uh you realize people realize that they need to reframe where they're coming from so the iceberg model is very important reframing uh purpose Purpose is central to this because i start with purpose so what's your purpose so as soon as the purpose shifts suddenly everything changes and um, I use the demand analysis at the beginning so that forces people to see things from the customer's perspective from an outside in perspective it forces them to do that they can't help it because once you put yourself in the customer's shoes and, and you look back at your organization you think oh wow uh, wow is that is that how we are is that how bad we actually are is um, and, for, and one of the reasons it takes time is that if you've been working in that service for a long time, you can't just make that shift from one day to the next. It, it does take time. Okay, good. Uh, how did I get invited in, John? Uh, that was because they just had a few th th surface things that they thought I could just help them with. They had no idea we were going to go and do this. So it was like, uh, oh, shit, you know. We thought we were going to just fix these few things and now you've helped us to uncover that actually we have far bigger problems than we thought we had uh, which which they did like actually you know they thought that's very good thank you for helping us to do that um uh, but yeah it's uh it was that's that's always the difficult thing is when you get invited in and then you have to help them move a little bit to see things in in other directions the national figure of housing need uh, is completely flawed so what happened because we've got over 6,000 people on the waiting list what actually happened uh, hang on a sec let me show you something which I would like to okay so I'm going to share my screen that one I think so you've seen that and you've seen those this is what happened nationally so the blue line is that organization 
So it took two years for it to drop. Now, once central government saw this, they thought, oh shit, we've, <laughs> we need to do something to help other local government to do that. They issued some new guidance and it started a, a drop in the overall housing figures uh, nationally, which is the yellow line. So I just wanted to show you that in answer to your question. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Paloma, for putting up the canvas of the iceberg model. There's also a lot of psychology in here, how people behave, how people think. And that, to me, is an important element of systems thinking. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult element to get into, but it's one that I think is more to do with soft systems thinking rather than system dynamics. So I, 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 the model I use has got a much more... Is, is much closer to soft systems thinking. Um, right, that's it. We've got five minutes left. Are, are there any more comments or questions? Um, no, I don't see any. Maybe we can close it up and have some feedback. Um, so I'm gonna share a screen again. Uh, congratulations, John, yeah. Thank you, Giselle. And, I hope this has helped you a little bit and to give you some ideas of maybe what you can do. Yeah, hopefully. I think it was a very practical example, John. So thank you for that. And so for the last minutes, I'm just going to ask you to come here to this section on the mural and put your feedback on. So did you find this useful? What would you like to see next? Uh, any topics you can drop here? Any um, topics you'd like to maybe talk about more? You would like the organizations have to deep dive onto or something. And here are the well the chat.